Hello, we're back at the .NET Comp. Uh, so welcome to my talk. It's the latest productivity updates in Visual Studio 2017, specifically for version 15.8. I'm Kendra Havens. I'm a program manager on .NET in Visual Studio. So if you haven't watched one of our productivity talks before, uh, we always try to cram in the tips and tricks and just the little things that make uh, coding in Visual Studio so much easier. So we have a lot of awesome updates to share. Uh, and again, a lot of these that I'll be going through were all cu customer asks. So if you filed uh, feedback on developer community or engaged with us on our GitHub repositories, thank you so much. The community being a part of this development is huge. Okay, let's dive in. So this is a general overview. First, I'll talk about all of the performance improvements that we've packed into all of the Visual Studio uh, version like 15.0 releases and also specifically what we got into 15.8. Uh, after that, I will basically do one whole demo of uh, refactorings and code fixes, source link debugging, uh, the different code cleanup options that we've recently added, as well as editor config tooling that we have and IntelliCode. If you don't know what some of these are, you are in for such a big treat. I'm so excited. Um, okay, so first off, performance. Uh, so specifically in Visual Studio 2017 version 15.8, the very latest stuff, we are still focusing so much on solution load. Performance is always one of the top things that customers bring up, and solution load is also right at the top um, within the performance category. So just in general, across this release cycle, solution load is already 25% faster in Visual Studio 2017 than it is in 2015. And I actually think that's a super conservative estimate, so I'd really love to know what you all experience in the wild. Uh, if you ever wanted to like do a blog post about how much better it is working for so your solution, I'd really love to see it. Uh, something we also focused on uh, improving performance for is branch switching. Uh, that can really interrupt your development flow if you're not uh, being able to switch in between branches really quickly, so we, we are focusing on that. Um, we also focused on unloading and reloading C Sharp and Visual Basic projects, making that a lot faster, uh, as well as test execution. Now, test execution, I'm extra excited about because that's what my team specifically works on every single day, um, besides just the general productivity category. So, listen in. Uh, for large test projects, if you run a few tests within them, that test execution is where we've seen the most improvement. So in our labs, for an MS test project with many different test projects with over 10,000 tests, when you're only running a single test, it can execute 82% faster. That's huge. We're so excited about that. Um, so I can't wait to show that later. Um, so also I just want to call out earlier across the versions in general 15 updates, much better solution load during the whole time we've made incremental improvements as well as much better test discovery. And I can't talk about performance with actually also having a uh, video all on test discovery. So I have a side-by-side -side comparison video. Um, you will see solution load just a little bit in the beginning. It kind of happened so fast because I didn't use a big enough solution for this. Um, that it's, it's hard to see the difference in, in, the, in the improvement across these updates, but test discovery is huge. So on the left, we have Visual Studio 2017 update 15.5, and on the right, we have update 15.8. Now they're both loading um, a 10,000 tests uh, project, and you can see on the right, it's already finished. So that was 10,000 tests discovered in less than five seconds. On the left side, we previously needed um, to build in order to discover tests because we discovered tests by assemblies back then. On the right, uh, we introduced source-based discovery. So I added a test, it was automatically discovered because it's just running over my source, I didn't need to build, and then I could execute that really quickly. On the left, it looks like we're still not quite up to Oh, okay, so it looks like it's discovered 10,000 tests, but when I right click, I can't quite execute it yet because it's still finding all of the information and loading it into the test explorer. 
and now it's discovered. So that took about 29 seconds. Uh, compare that to what it is now at 4.75. Huge improvement. Okay. Uh, so moving on per from performance, let's dive right into productivity tips and tricks. Now, I want to give you guys sort of a, let's see, what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> warning, the next slide is really text heavy. Ah, okay. This is because we have packed in so many features into even minor Visual Studio releases. So here on the right, I've kind of sectioned off everything I'm about to dive into for 15.8. This will include new keyboard profiles for VS Code and ReSharper, refactorings, the, all of those you access through control dot and their code fixes. We've got for loop to for each, invert if, uh, converting to a ternary conditional, you can have a code fix to add a parameter from the call site, as well as removing extra parentheses, which I'm going to use all the time. Uh, we also have, finally, multi-cursor mode, officially in 15.8. You don't need an uh, extra, extra extension. You don't need to turn on a feature flag. It's just there by default. It is Control-Alt-Click. So excited to show that to you guys. Um, we also added improved our navigation a bit. So the control T navigation or our go to all, we also added a recent files uh, a shortcut that I'll show you soon. And we also have a navigation uh, keyboard shortcut for going to the enclosing block. Uh, then in my demo, I'll dive into the code cleanup, one click code cleanup, control KD. Really excited to share more about that. And the code cleanup configuration and tools options that we've added. Uh, I'll also cover IntelliCode, which is really exciting. Okay. Uh, throughout this demo, I'll also be wanting to call out just the major improvements that we've made previously across Visual Studio versions, because there's so many. Um, I'll definitely go over source link debugging. It's, uh, I think it did come out in 15.8, but it is compatible back to 15.7, uh, which is very exciting. So. I'll kind of be covering navigate to decompiled assemblies, uh, go to definition, uh, all of the test explorer improvements just that we've made in uh, earlier versions, just so people know they, they're hearing the big stuff. OK. Did I call out everything? Yeah, that looks good. <laughs> OK, let's dive into the demo. Ugh, escape PowerPoint, gross. OK, so I'm generally going to be opening our Smart Hotel 360 app. Uh, this app, you've probably seen if you watched any of our build demos. Uh, what were the most recent things? If you have uh, gone to any of the Visual Studio Live, et cetera, um, you might have seen our Smart Hotel 360. It's just a general web app that runs on an Azure app service uh, that allows hotel guests to book rooms or uh, book services through our website. So I'll go ahead and open that. And if you will, keep your eye on the Test Explorer, because I'll never get over how excited I am about <laughs> source-based discovery. So yeah, it loaded, and boom, 5,000 tests discovered in a matter of seconds. So nice. Um, so as you can see, I can expand the Test Explorer to see a hierarchy view. That was a huge customer ask. It's organized by project namespace and class. I think we got that in first in 15.6, uh, but still major feature people are excited about. Another major one, um, since we're already inside of the Test Explorer, is actually making more resp responsive test runs. So as I run this, you can see tests pending to execute get this clock icon, and tests that are currently executing get a progress ring. This is so key when you have a really long test run and you're trying to figure out what uh, is holding up your test run and what is taking so long, and you have a suspicion. You're like, OK, I think this test is the culprit. You're actually immediately getting feedback on that in the Test Explorer. So we're really excited to sort of be able to easily identify whatever laggy test that you might be seeing. OK, before I dive into my code, I actually wanted to show you uh, 
our new key bindings. So you can easily get there by typing keyboard and quick launch or just going to tools options. It's under environment and keyboard. And I'm definitely going to use the default for this uh, demo because that's what I'm really comfortable in. But we now have an option to use ReSharper key bindings as well as Visual Studio Code. So it'll make it so much easier if you find yourself switching between ID IDEs and which is great because we just want to make you more productive. OK. And before I dive into my whole demo code flow, I actually want to, oh, right. I didn't uh, show off more of test discovery. If I uncomment a test, it'll, boom, automatically appears in the test explorer. I mean, yeah, I'll never get tired of demoing that. So it didn't require a build for it actually to appear. Super, super helpful. Uh, okay, so with the first code fix that I want to show off, it is actually caused by a merge conflict. So I'll go ahead and uh, cause a merge conflict really quick. <laughs> uh, so I'll go up to Merge in the Team Explorer, and I'll select to merge master with um, this add test branch that I already had. Oh, yeah, and I'll go ahead and save. So merge conflict appears because on my other branch, I had already tried to add a similar uh, method at the same place. You can see the code fix is appearing already. Um, so you can kind of give us some more room here. So I can see when I hit control dot, which opens up the light bulb that I get, I can choose what branch I would like to take in order to resolve the merge conflict. And I can even choose both and it'll just erase the uh, comments that the merge conflict inserted. So I'll go ahead and take the head. There we go. OK, so now let's focus in on, so that is a 15.8 feature. And that was actually um, submitted by the community, which was very, very cool. So thank you, contributors. <laughs> um, all right, so I want to go ahead and investigate one of my failing tests right here. Uh, and actually, since I want more room to work with this, uh, one minute. Oh, just wanted to check something really quick. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's not loading. OK. There we go. OK, now I'll feel better. Sorry. OK, so let's go ahead and check um, what's happening with this null check. Why is it causing it? Why is it failing? So since I'll be working a lot with tests and trying to get it to pass again, I'm going to go ahead and start live unit testing. now. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about it for now, but just to make sure everyone's on the same page, live unit testing can listen to your code changes as you type and run t any tests that are affected by those code changes in the background as you're developing. And it will give feedback uh, in the margin on that test, uh, whether for whether to, so you know whether or not it passed or failed. Uh, so, if you guys remember, I had 5,000 tests in this project. I know some of them are just perf tests or regression tests or integration tests. They're not unit tests, so I don't actually want to include them in live unit testing because they're less interesting at this point. Um, something we added to live unit testing is the ability to exclude a large test project. So now I know that uh, the tests that are running over my code are only the unit tests and not those integration tests that I didn't want running. So I can actually get feedback in the feedback that I want right in the, the uh, margin. So I'll go ahead and use control click to investigate my uh, text housekeeping uh, method. So this is generally, this is part of my um, go green request. You could see that the title of the test was my go green null test was failing. So this is if a customer at our uh, hotel wanted to uh, go green for a while and opt out of uh, the, all of the new towels and like getting new sheets every single day because nobody needs that much. Uh, so this checks, so uh, as part of that function, they can also text housekeeping and we can insert a message for them. Uh, but it looks like um, the go green null test uh, is throwing an exception. So I'm getting a null reference. So I'm going to go ahead and debug this. And 
just wanted to really quick call out that we have an awesome exception helper that pops up uh, now when you're debugging in Visual Studio 2017. You can actually manage the options of why it will appear. Um, so I'm getting uh, my message is null, and it's null reference exception. So I'll go ahead and stop debugging and add a null check. One of the many code fixes and refactorings, of course, is our null check. You might have seen it before, but here's what's brand new in 15.8. When I drag this down and I make it a part of my if statements, that's checking whether or not the customer has had housekeeping within the past seven days, uh, I get an interesting little uh, sort of prompt here. I can tell that my parentheses are actually grayed out. So in 15.8, we added remove unnecessary parentheses. Uh, and now that I see that it's there, I'm actually noticing I get this everywhere in my code. Um, I guess I was always the kid in the English classroom that added way too many commas to their sentence. Um, so I guess when I learned code, uh, learned to code, I started doing the same thing with parentheses. So luckily, um, Roslyn, uh, we have a Roslyn analyzer to take care of that for you. Um, so something else you might have noticed when I was uh, opening my code fix for this area, when I hit control click inside of an if statement, um, it actually offers for me to invert the if else statement. Uh, so I can go ahead and hit that. Uh, and that's just a really kind of clever, helpful thing that helps you refactor code really easily. Um, Something I also wanted to call out that as soon as I um, placed in these null checks, I now have passing tests. So live unit testing was already in the background, rerunning my test uh, for me. So uh, I'll go ahead and do the oh, invert null check up here. Uh, but I do really hate when return false is before return true. I don't know why. That's just me. So I think I'll go ahead and go back. There we go. So there we go. Uh, so we got a few other uh, options within when we hit control dot and we had clicked inside the if statement. One of these is converting it to a conditional expression. So that was a very simple, so this converts uh, a very simple if else statement that returns true or false into a ternary expression. And then, of course, I'm getting prompted to also just use an expression body for this method. Um, something I want to call out is that if I had a more complicated if else statement that maybe had an if statement nesting inside of it and it wasn't always returning true there, oops. There we go. Um, if I try to trigger this code fix again, whew, I actually no longer get the prompt to, uh, re to transform it into a ternary condition. So it kind of only suggests it when it's a simple fix that you can easily do on your code and doesn't when um, your code is a bit more interesting. So I'll go ahead and convert it to a ternary expression and then go ahead and make that a uh, Expression body. Ah, oh, feels really good. Okay, just got my demo cheat sheet to make sure I don't skip any of these because I'm going too fast. Okay, so when we're texting housekeeping, um, this client is sending us a message, and I actually wrote uh, an Azure Cognitive service that could run over the guest comments that guests are leaving and actually give a sentiment score. Uh, for how they're doing. So uh, within this, I'm actually iterating through this little sentiment batch result item um, in order to calculate the score in text housekeeping. One of the refactorings we added is the ability to convert from four to four each. So I can rename um, my variable that I'm using to iterate it, and I can also convert back from a for loop to a for each. Just a really simple code refactoring that is all about sort of uh, someone's taste and how easy it is for them to read code, uh, we now have right in the editor. So uh, let's see if I, yeah, okay, I'm doing good. Phew. 
<laughs> uh, so one of the other refactorings that's right in this area is um, converting to from link to for each. So we're really excited to show this off because it was definitely a top customer request. Um, so if I go ahead and woo, select, oh sorry, shift alt select my link statement. There we go. I can trigger the code fi fix so I can convert my link query to for each. And I mean, not that I've ever had issues reading link, but really, if there's anyone new on your team who uh, isn't as familiar with the latest C Sharp features, it's really nice to have this code fix in. Uh, so we don't yet have the code fix to convert for each back to a link. Um, but we really hope, I hope that I can demo that around Dev 16 previews, maybe Connect timeframe, maybe Ignite timeframe. It'd definitely be in preview there, but we understand that that is definitely a high interest code fix to get in. Okay, so uh, going back up to this uh, calculate chocolate method, I am actually only texting housekeeping to leave more chocolates. Uh, if the sentiment score is underneath 0.5. So it analyzes the uh, guest comment and then it gives a score uh, from zero to one. It's just a pretty easy to use uh, Azure Cognitive Service. So what I'm not doing is actually calculating how many chocolates that we should leave based on how negative their score was. So what if I went ahead and added that here? So what if I did something like 10 minus, uh-oh, I'm going to get <laughs> warnings for using way too many parentheses again. See, told you guys. Um, so what if I had something more like this? Uh, let's go ahead and remove that extra parentheses. And uh, you actually see I had another code fix pop up there. I can also add the extra parentheses um, to make the meeting more clear. Uh, because, hey, order of op operations is pretty smart. There we go. We'll have that all in one line because it's easier to read. So in this case, if the customer had a sentiment of like 0.4, uh, it would get down here and it times it by 10, so it'd be 4, and then 10 minus 4 is 6. So I would text housekeeping to leave 6 extra chocolates on the pillow, right? Um, but the text housekeeping method doesn't actually have that parameter. So this is our code fix for adding the parameter from the call site. So now that I did that, you see I don't get an error. And if I actually navigate to text housekeeping, which control click, uh, you can see that it added this uh, double. So if I actually went to the error list, you'd see I call this method in a lot of other places. So I should definitely add a default value. And that takes care, yeah, of the other um, issues I was having. So um, I definitely want to include this in housekeeping in my message. So I might as well just be using an interpolated string. Ah, that was such an easy fix to do. Feels so good. Man, interrelated strings, get on board, everyone. <laughs> OK, so something you might have noticed. Let's see if I got everything. Yep, looks good. OK, so something you might have noticed when I was working in the calculate chocolate method was I didn't actually have any um, live unit testing tests running. Um, that's because the test that I have for this isn't actually included in live unit testing. And I'll show you why. So I want to navigate to my chocolate sentiment test. So I should use control T for that, right? And I could use the regular camel case searching, was, which is pretty fantastic. Or let's say it's a Monday and I don't actually remember the camel case or even like my test name. I can also choose, but I do know I was working in it recently. I can also just type R now. So it'd be control T R and that will bring up all of the files I've most recently been using. You can also click uh, this little recent files clock icon in order to open this up. So control T navigation has always had, you've been able to type an F for specifically searching for files, a T for types, an M for members. Um, now we have R, recent files. So pretty wonderful. I'll go over to my chocolate sentiment. So test, so this test has a skip when live unit testing category because, as you remember, this is actually calling an Azure Cognitive Service. And I don't exactly want that running every single time that I make a code change, right? 
it's not that that would be too many interactions, uh, but I would not expect to get like 3,000 interactions in one coding session from the Azure Cognitive Service. So I probably just want to keep those a manual run. So this test is actually in a test file with several other projects that are included in live unit testing, but since this has a skip category, I can avoid it. OK. So uh, this test is actually failing. Um, so it looks like it actually doesn't have enough. Um, let's see. So inputs uh, returning to grant a chocolate sentiment. So what I should do is put in some more uh, guest comments that are more negative. Um, so I can select these and hit Control D to duplicate them. That's one of the newer code fixes as well. And then, get ready for it, multi-cursor. I can hit Control, Alt, and click in multiple places in order to edit code in all of them. So I'll say, very bad, awful, um, needs more chocolate. There we go. And as you notice, Azure Cognitive Services is pretty cool here. I'm actually entering in multiple different languages, and then it's converting it into the sentiment score that I need. So uh, that's just also a really helpful thing. So it looks like I added four more negative comments. Oh, wait. Let's see. I think I misspelled chocolate. Can I go ahead? Oh, it undoes all of them. That's right. Oh, but if I, I actually still have my cursor there. So I'll go ahead and spell it correctly. There we go. OK, so I can use my code lens icon to rerun this test manually. And it should pass. Running, running. There's the tiny running icon. Hmm, I was talking too long. Oh, there we go. OK, so <laughs> it passed. Um, OK, so I wasn't super familiar with Azure Cognitive Services when I was first building up this app. One thing that was really, really helpful um, when building out my service for this, uh, I needed to learn a few couple things, or a few things about this uh, NuGet reference that I'm using. And so I didn't know exactly what they expected to have, like a multi-language input. I didn't know um, how we needed to read the guest comments as strings into the correct format in order to make like a language batch result. Um, so I could use uh, just my cursor to hover over it and get more info about what uh, this method expects me to be inputting. But one thing that was super helpful was navigating to the decompiled source. So this is navigate to decompiled assemblies. Um, you do need to turn it on. It's not on by default. You can turn it on in the text editor. Whoops, that's not it. I thought it'd take me right there. Text editor. There we go. Um, so it's the text editor, I think it's C sharp and advanced. So this is your enable navigate to decompiled sources and it is still in experimental. So we partnered with uh, Isle Spy to use their decompiler in order to decompile a source. And uh, usually you will see like a EULA agreement pop up to make sure that we're allowed to be decompiling one of your NuGet references. So Make sure you pay attention to that. But I know this is Azure Cognitive Services. They're totally OK with me doing it. So um, if you focus back in here, you actually see more than just getting what order of strings I needed to read into this, language, ID, and then text. I also got that, oh, language, they're expecting a two-letter ISO representation, so like EN for English or ES for Spanish. So that's really helpful to know what input they're expecting. Uh, so that's navigate to decompiled sources. But what if uh, the NuGet reference that I'm using is actually open source? Uh, that brings me to source link debugging. So I'll go ahead and jump to a different test so I can show you source link debugging. This is my airport shuttle request test. So I was sort of in the middle of implementing uh, uh, function for my user is that so the guests of the heart our hotel would be able to uh, order an airport and get or sorry order a shuttle in order to get to the airport 
uh, in order to do this, I took a dependency on Casey Ullenhut's Bus Helper's uh, Nougat reference. So let me show you what source link debugging can do. I can set a breakpoint, and I'll go ahead and debug this test. So as soon as I step into this, since I know this NuGet reference has source link, I'm actually stepping in to the reference. So I can see how someone else's NuGet reference is handling the inputs I give it as I step through it. If I hover over this little bushelpers.cs file at the top, I can see that this source is actually in my um, app local data sources, so, or data source server. So this is actually not a part of my source code, but since uh, Casey Ullenhut, the package maintainer, was able to publish it with uh, .NET Core SDK 2.1.3 or later, and uh, all the maintainers need to do is change a few things within the CS project in order to enable this, uh, I'm actually able to step through her source. So. Uh, something you also th see is that this also has a commit ID within it. So you actually know the particular commit that the publisher used to publish their NuGet package. So when you're like browsing through the source online, you will know what you're actually debugging through because you can still compare commits. Very cool. So I'm sure a couple more things I want to call out about debugging is we've added this run to click debugging. Super easy to use if your hand is already on the mouse. Uh, something else that we're extremely si excited to talk about more is this little tiny arrow in the top. So this is step back debugging. And as soon as I hit this, I actually go into an historical debugging mode. So this is not recompiling my code, but I can step back and see what the local variables were and their values when I had compiled that step. This is super helpful if you, for if you ever realize you step just a little bit too far and you don't want to recompile that line of code by like um, clicking run to click above your method or above your stepper where you currently are, you can just step back and see what those variables were. So I could click return to live debugging or uh, if I step all the way forward again, I will actually enter back into just the regular debugging mode. So sort of back to live debugging. Um, so we're really excited to show off that historical debugging feature. OK, so that was source link debugging, as well as the run to click and step back debugging, all of which we're really excited about. The next major thing that I want to talk about is IntelliCode. So we've always known generally like good programming practices to have and what we should be recommending to users but it's about time machines started teaching us instead so IntelliCode is uh, an extension right now in Visual Studio so it's not uh, there by default you got to go grab it I would highly recommend doing so uh, IntelliCode is uh, an extension that offers better dot completion, better overloads, and a few other things. So what it is, is a machine algorithm that ran over 2,000 .NET repositories that are in the open source, out on GitHub, and figured out what the best coding practices and coding styles people are using in certain situations. So let me show you it in action. So here I'm calling dot on this little first shuttle a string. So the most common overloads or properties or uh, sorry methods that people would use on a string are now listed up at the top. Before, without IntelliCode, we just sort of have this static alphabetical list. That's not getting people anywhere fast. Um, so it actually is saying that the most common uh, property that people use in a doc completion would be length on string. Um, so IntelliCode is super great in that if I change this to expect a string array instead of just a var and I type dot completion again, uh, I actually now get split at the top. So that's what it expects. So if I went ahead and did that and then uh, typed a parenthesis in order to trigger my overload suggestions, you can see IntelliCode again. So 
which is helpful because split actually has 10 overloads, and it can tell me what is the most common overload used for this uh, method. So it's super helpful. Um, so even if I change this back to var, now I mentioned that IntelliCode can also learn what context you're operating in. So I just called split right above this method. It now thinks as soon as someone calls split, it is more likely that they call trim. So you'll notice if this had no context around it, it still would have been dot length up at the top. Just a really cool feature. Um, and then if I do my dot completion a third time, it now knows that I'm actually just repeating myself. So it is offering split uh, again because that's what I will more likely want to use in this context. So this is super helpful. This is a date time uh, function. So if I do dot completion on that, similar sort of uh, recommendations are at the top. Um, so it's really popular on like commonly used types. So assert is definitely one of those. So it'll have top suggestions for assert as well as like top overloads for the most common things used in assert. Um, the last thing I want to call out about IntelliCode is let's take, for example, Casey Ulin Hoot's bus helper NuGet reference. So I don't actually have this class library uh, was not one of the libraries that IntelliCode trained on properly, probably, or it's just not used as commonly. So you won't see IntelliCode suggestions there, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Okay, so that is IntelliCode. So the last thing, well, one of the other code fixes that I want to show you, or sorry, this is a navigation uh, shortcut is control alt, alt up arrow. That is jumping to your enclosing block. So it'll only work for jumping from the bottom to the top. So if I put my cursor inside of my class and hit control alt up arrow, I will jump to the top of my class. So just another just nice little navigation feature uh, that you find yourself using a lot. So ugh, what is the code style and spacing happening over here? This does not look good. Um, don't worry, we'll get rid of this in a second. Um, one thing that we are really excited to introduce is the one click clo code cleanup. So that is control KD. Ah, oh, feels so much better with my spacing. But I'm noticing it didn't actually apply the var rule, even though I'm being prompted with a code suggestion for it to apply. Um, so, uh, in order to change this, that, that's actually because we put the var code style rule um, as unchecked by default. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. So I can go to my cleanup options, and that is in text editor, C sharp, code style, formatting, general. Or if you forget that line of things, just hit control Q. It'll put your cursor in quick launch, and you can type in cleanup. And it'll bring you right where you need to be. So this apply implicit explicit type preferences is now unchecked by default. We realized that would probably be a more gentle interaction to code cleanup. We don't need people um, you know, breaking each other into jail with that one uh, when you're trying to just apply code styles with your team. So I'll hit control KD again, and now I have explicit types. Okay, so I also wanted to mention really quick that when I was in the options up there, uh, you can also set a lot of your code style preferences in the IDE from Visual Studio. So it's interesting, I actually have preferring explicit type, but I'm not actually offering a suggestion, only a refactoring, but you're still seeing that I'm getting a, well, I was getting a suggestion uh, in my actual code file. This is because I have an editor config. So editor configs can overrule the code style rules that you have set through the Visual Studio UI. And I wish that I could demo um, the ability to export the code style rules that you've already set through Visual Studio into an editor config file format. That's something we're definitely working on. We hear you. Uh, hopefully, maybe that'll be like a Dev 16 preview. Oh, I'm sorry, Visual Studio 2019 uh, preview kind of thing that we can show later, but not yet. But we're working on it. Uh, so, if you, a lot of you may have heard about editor config before. 
uh, it's in absolutely like applauding the community kind of thing. Editor config existed before, like apart from .NET, and we adopted it because it was an awesome sort of code style and universal formatting guide that people could use across IDEs and languages. So we adopted it and worked with that community, awesome stuff, um, and created our own .NET code style. So this is what you see uh, in this .editor config that I have in my solution. But you realize that, yeah, these can be, these might be kind of tedious to set yourself. Um, so what I actually want to show you is where editor config and IntelliCode intersect. So I'll actually go ahead and save this file. OK, so over in my Solution Explorer, like, uh, let's say that I wanted to, I really liked all of the coding style in my public web dot tests project. If I wanted an editor config that exactly matches the code style that I'm already following in the project, IntelliCode can help me make that. So what I need to do is right click, add a new item, and search for editor config. Oop, config. So we have a default editor config and a .NET editor config, but if you have the IntelliCode extension installed on your machine, uh, you can actually create an IntelliCode inferred editor config. Now, another awesome thing about editor config is that it can nest and it's director, directory based. So uh, this editor config will still inherit from the root that I have at on my solution level. Uh, but any rules that it has specifically set, it will overrule, but only within my public web dot test context. So I can have different code style rules in my test project versus my project code. So if I went ahead and looked at the comments here, um, I can actually see that this file was initially inferred by Visual Studio IntelliCode from my test project. So that is super helpful. Um, uh, and it also has the date listed in there, so I know when it was actually conferred, inferred. So if I scroll down to where I am setting my uh, var rules, and I go ahead and change my using var for built-in types to true, and go back to my guess or test test, request test, uh, you will now see it rerun over this test. Or maybe not. Or maybe I'll switch this again and save it and then go back. There we go. OK, maybe it just needed <laughs> a little bit more time. So now I am getting the code fix to um, apply var instead of the explicit type. And I could do this in my whole document, or I could just hit Control KD again, because I know it's now being picked up as a uh, uh, under those code style rules. Okay, so that is IntelliCode combined with editor config. Um, now, see, you thought I was making a statement about using var or explicit types, but now we're just back to using var. So I am completely neutral in that argument. We're not starting it here. This is a war free zone. <laughs> okay, um, so that was a lot of content. Let's do a quick recap back on the slides. Um, so, oh, we'll go here. Mm, okay, so I showed off new keyboard profiles, uh, several refactorings, for loop to for each, invert if, invert if uh, ternary conditional, all of that. I won't read through all of them again. Um, something you might have noticed uh, with all of these features being added to every single version, even minor versions of Visual Studio, uh, is that there's a lot of them, first off. And um, we're iterating very fast. And I can't stress this enough. A lot of this is due to our really big decision of re-architecting the Roslyn compiler that we first shipped back in Visual Studio 2015. So Roslyn was our C Sharp and Visual Basic compiler that was re-architected to be an extendable API that was completely focused on being open source and more of a platform for a community to plug into. Um, the community had an 
awesome response to that. I know the merge conflict uh, code fix is definitely contributed by the community. I think there are a few more in there. Um, but we just had a really incredible response there. Uh, so part of extending Roslyn is being able to create your own Roslyn analyzers. So I just want to take you through really quick what that looks like. I think it's so important that people sort of wrap their heads around uh, what exactly creating your, Ros your own Roslyn analyzer means. So if I went ahead and uh, created an analyzer code fix provi provider, I'm only getting these errors because it haven't, hasn't restored. Um, I can actually launch an analyzer project, and in doing so, it launches another version of Visual Studio. I'm not sure if you all have seen this before, but it's very meta. <laughs> so you're running Visual Studio from Visual Studio. So sometimes it takes a little bit longer to start up, but this version of Visual Studio is being launched by this one. So if I went ahead and opened my console project, um, I can actually see our default analyzer template running over it. And sure, it takes a little bit of extra time for Visual Studio to also launch Visual Studio, but I feel like the metaphor is strong <laughs> uh, when, I, when I do go through it. Preparing solution, there we go. Okay, so here I have just a class named Kendra and our default um, analyzer, just when you file new project Roslyn analyzer, is making a code fix that changes your class name to all caps. So it's make up or case. So I can actually set a uh, breakpoint within there. I'll probably need to maybe set it down there. Oops. Uh, and open up my other version. There we go. And now when I hit the control dot to open my code fix, it actually triggered a break in my analyzer project in Visual Studio. So that's sort of what analyzer development implies. Um, it's really fun to do and the community has had such an incredible response to using it. Um, actually, I think I'll go ahead and show you uh, one of them. If I went ahead and opened an XUnit project, you can see what Roslyn analyzers the XUnit community has already made um, using the Roslyn APIs and they're very cool. So uh, you can see in my Solution Explorer that I actually have an XUnit project rule set. Um, that's because I went ahead and grabbed the NuGet reference that applies uh, XUnit analyzers. So these are all of the rules um, that, I'll see, that I'll be seeing. So one of these is, for example, fact methods cannot have parameters. So what if I went ahead and tried to woo, add one? So you can immediately see that I'm getting a code fix that says, oh, hey, if you're using, if you want to use a parameter, that should actually be an X unit theory. Um, so that can apply a code fix. Oh, let's see. Oh, I think it's just prompting me to. Um, so I could just convert that to a theory in order to get that to pass. So that's, those code fixes and analyzers aren't provided by, you know, Microsoft. That was, that was our tools that were then taken by the community and they ran with them. And it's a very cool library to check out. Okay. Um, something else I love to call out uh, during talks. Well, first I'll, I'll skip on to the resources so that you guys kind of have a launching point. Um, and then I'll talk about docs at the end because it's the last resource that I mentioned. So uh, all of the tips and tricks uh, for Visual Studio that I just showed you, you can, all the little code refactorings and everything I just went over, you can get at aka.ms slash vs2017 guide. Uh, so that'll have much more documentation and actually write out the, the, all the keyboard shortcuts that I just used, because I know that's hard to keep up sometimes when I'm just saying them out loud. 
um, you can go and grab the IntelliCode extension at aka.ms slash IntelliCode. And if you are a NuGet package maintainer and you'd like to enable source link for, your, for the people consuming your package, you can go to github.com slash .net slash source link to find more information about how to hook up your source and how to publish your uh, reference with what you need to enable source link. Um, throughout the demo, I used live unit testing. Uh, so that is an enterprise only feature. You can learn more about it at aka.ms slash live unit testing. Uh, so I know uh, a lot of people really love to focus in only on the like Visual Studio version 15.8 brand new features. So I went ahead and made a like one page simple tutorial on all of the productivity 15.8 features. That's in my repository. It's Kendra Haven, it's on GitHub slash Kendra Haven slash productivity dash 15.8. Uh, so you can download that and check that out. It's a really simple, you just go straight through the, the file and uh, enable all of the refactorings that I explain how to do in the comments on all of the methods. Uh, so the last thing I want to call out and what I always like to kind of, it's kind of a public service announcement, is that our docs are open source. And you can submit pull requests to them and they're wonderful to use. So I'll go ahead and go over there right now. So this is our Visual Studio 2017 C Sharp productivity guide. Um, always you can change your theme from dark to light, absolutely wonderful. I mean from light to dark and always leave it there. Um, and I can hit this edit button and this will bring me right to where this document is hosted on GitHub. On, um, so I think Myra Wenzel has a talk um, later during .NET Conf. I think it's uh, probably not tomorrow, but the next day. Um, and I'm guessing she'll be talking all about um, our open source docs and how she maintains it. She does a ton of work on the .NET docs and it's wonderful to work with her. So you can easily uh, navigate to where the doc is hosted on GitHub and click this little edit button. And you can edit the doc right in your browser. You don't even need to actually clone the repository if it's a small change. Um, and then you can propose the file change and make a PR request right in your browser. It's really easy to do, especially for docs. It's also kind of a good um, uh, starter uh, project. Anyway, uh, so that was Visual Studio 2017 productivity. Um, thanks so much for watching.